In the early 20th century, Arthur Cowboy Hill embarked on a criminal career in Ohio involving murder, robbery, safe cracking, jewel heists, bootlegging, and more. A pioneer in the use of automobiles as a means of escape for bank robberies, Hill proved to be Ohio's first public enemy. After being arrested for burglary and skipping bail in 1913, Hill was sent to Mansfield Reformatory. Further evidence revealed he was wanted in Illinois for leading a gang involved in fraudulent checks. Deemed too dangerous for the reformatory, he was transferred to Ohio State Penitentiary. Hill, using an alias, tricked the guards into thinking he was an inmate set to be released. Hill walked out of the prison before anyone realized their grave mistake. On the run, he continued his criminal activities, including safe-blowing and suspected involvement in a jewelry store robbery where the shop owner was shot. Hill was eventually captured after a chase where he reportedly laughed at his pursuers when they shot at him. After a failed escape attempt from the Lenawee County Jail, he was taken back to the Ohio State Penitentiary. Upon his arrival, 500 lawmen from all over the state had gathered to catch a glimpse of the infamous scoundrel. For reasons unknown, Hill failed to complete his 12-year sentence. By 1920, he had reunited with his associates and resumed his criminal activities. On Saturday morning, April 10, 1920, Cowboy Hill and three accomplices brazenly entered West Carrollton Bank in Montgomery County. Disregarding disguises, they brandished firearms without concern for the onlookers outside. Two of the criminals approached Cashier Wee Dean and Assistant Cashier Alice M. Retique, wielding revolvers and demanding immediate access to the cash. The bandits bound Alice's hands and forced her into the vault while instructing Dean to hand over the money. Dean surrendered the $15,000 payroll allocated for West Carrollton Parchment Company and the American Envelope Company, along with an additional $7,200 from the previous day. As this unfolded, Edward Beckett entered the bank to cash a check, only to find himself facing the barrel of a gun. He was instructed to face the wall, and he complied. Charles Christian, a salesman from the Parchment Company, became the next unfortunate customer through the doors. Confronted with a revolver, he was ordered to raise his hands and face the wall. Resisting, he was subjected to a pistol whipping. Meanwhile, one of the robbers escorted Dean into the safety deposit vault, seizing $4,000 to $5,000 in Liberty Bonds and other securities. Fourteen-year-old Chester Holliday and a woman named Elizabeth Kohler entered the bank at this juncture, encountering misfortune as one of the robbers struck the boy in the back of the head and ordered both into the vault. Dean, Rydick, and the other bank customers were corralled to the back of the vault. The Dayton Daily News reported the presence of a six-year-old child among the victims, with the news story noting seven victims in total. The robbers fled the bank and hastily jumped into a blue Hudson touring car with red wheels. Before speeding toward Dayton, one of them flipped up the license plate to prevent identification. The thieves successfully made off with approximately $22,000 in cash, along with the Liberty Bonds. Despite the assurances from bank officials about burglary insurance, the criminal struck again on May 20, 1920, at 10.20 in the morning, targeting the People's Savings Bank in Delta, Ohio. Hill and six others stormed in, aggressively pushing a customer aside. One of the men aimed a gun at assistant cashier M.W. Kassler, and chaos ensued as three robbers leaped over the railing at the cashier's desk. They seized Kassler, grabbed the bookkeeper, and attempted to apprehend Candace Haley, the second assistant cashier. However, Haley managed to trigger the burglar alarm. You started that alarm, now you stop it, one of the thugs ordered, but she defiantly refused. Hill and his gang corralled the bank employees into a back room, with a bandit stationed at the front door to intercept unsuspecting customers. Responding to the alarm, James E. Flavel, Roy Champlin, and Arthur Beckler entered the bank and were promptly ushered into the back room at gunpoint. The robbers then aimed a submachine gun at Kassler, coercing him to disable the alarm and open the secure vault. Once the money was collected, Kassler was forced into the room with the others. As he walked past, one of the robbers struck him over the head with the butt of his gun. Outside, a crowd had gathered, and as the robbers burst out of the doors, they fired wildly, unleashing a barrage of bullets into the street. Thirty to fifty rounds whizzed through the air, causing collateral damage. 
The robbers fled towards Toledo, escaping with $12,000 in cash and $6,000 in Liberty Bonds. Toledo police were promptly notified, and officers patrolled the city entrances. By afternoon, they spotted the suspect car entering the city at Upton Avenue. Despite a chase, the gang's Cadillac outpaced the police vehicles. A $5,000 reward was announced, leading to the identification of Hill, Archie James Nair, and two others as suspects. Wanted posters circulated, and the suspects were indicted by a grand jury. Edward T. O'Neill, alias Malady, a member of Hill's gang, was apprehended in Toledo. Witnesses positively identified him, resulting in his trial, conviction, and sentencing to the Ohio State Penitentiary. The reward increased after Hill and his gang targeted the commercial bank in Moline, Illinois, using the same methods as in West Carrollton and Delta. Five men stormed in, guns blazing, and swiftly relieved the bank and customers of $20,000. As they fled, firing their guns, the owner of a nearby barber shop was severely wounded. The desperados piled into their Cadillac, encountering a moment of panic when it wouldn't start. In a frantic attempt, one bandit tried to steal a parked car, but faced resistance from the owner. Shots were fired, but luck favored the thieves, and the Cadillac roared to life, allowing them to escape. On Tuesday, September 14, 1920, Toledo police detectives acted on months of gathered information about Hill's gang and their string of bank and payroll robberies across Ohio and Michigan. Chief of Detectives William D. Delahanty described the raid as the result of extensive investigations and searches of 15 potential hideouts. Fourteen well-armed lawmen divided among five automobiles headed for an apartment complex in Toledo's upscale West End neighborhood. Concealing their presence, they quietly approached the apartment, riot shotguns in hand, surrounding the building with orders to secure doors and windows. At 9.30 a.m., Detective Stephen Quinn, Captain James M. O'Reilly, and Detectives William C. Culver and August Augie Salhoff knocked on the door, greeted by gang member Joe Forrest. Unarmed and tall, the 41-year-old Forrest raised his hands, offering no resistance to O'Reilly's arrest. As detectives warned him to stay quiet, they continued searching the house. Detective Culver progressed further, shotgun ready, and discovered a breakfast table set for five in the dining room. In a bedroom doorway off the hall, 32-year-old bandit Archie Dennison confronted Culver, pulling a large semi-automatic pistol. Acting swiftly, Culver raised his shotgun and fired just as Dennison tried to escape. The buckshot tore through the door, hitting Dennison in the face. Mortally wounded, Dennison staggered into the next room. Detective Quinn rushed in and grappled with Dennison, resulting in a struggle that sent them both crashing over a chair. Despite his face injuries, Dennison managed to fire a shot, hitting Detective Quinn in the right hip. Meanwhile, gang leader Cowboy Hill, brandishing 2.45 automatic pistols, fled out the rear door. Detective Robert F. Bartley and others guarding the back unleashed a barrage of bullets from shotguns and pistols. Hill, firing wildly, attempted escape but was relentlessly shot at until he collapsed at the gate, sustaining 28 wounds. Hill fired his last round, yelling defiantly, Take that! Before admitting defeat, Don't shoot anymore. You got me real good and proper. Over a hundred shots were fired, leaving a scene of carnage. As the smoke cleared, two young women emerged from a bedroom, one hiding under a bed and the other seeking refuge in a cedar chest. Unfazed by the violence, they calmly prepared to go to the police station, dressed in what the papers described as handsome walking suits, even taking a moment to powder their noses. Stepping over Dennison's body on their way out, they showed no concern about getting blood on their shoes. At the detective bureau, bandits Calhoun and Cochran were questioned and then transferred to the LaGrange Street station. Detective Quinn and Cowboy Hill were taken to Mercy Hospital, Dennison, whose head wound dated back to a shootout with motorcycle officer Walter Cruz on September 3rd, succumbed to his injuries. Officer Cruz, seriously wounded in that encounter, survived but was placed on disability. During the Franklin Avenue raid, Joe Forrest cooperated with detectives, providing a lead to a Door Street garage 
where they found a car matching the description from the Van Street shooting. The Franklin Avenue apartment yielded a trove of weapons, including high-powered rifles, handguns, burglary tools, and a can of nitroglycerin with fuses for safe blowing. For the remainder of 1920, Cowboy Hill lay on a stretcher in the Lucas County Jail. In January 1921, he pleaded guilty to possession of burglary tools, with the court waiving more severe charges. Sentenced to one to five years, his attorney argued for better medical treatment at the Ohio State Penitentiary. Hill arrived at the penitentiary gate supported by two men. Released from the penitentiary in 1928, Cowboy Hill found himself facing the long arm of the law once more. The sheriff of Fulton County awaited him at the prison gates, ready to arrest him for the People Savings Bank job in Delta, Ohio. Convicted and sentenced to 15 additional years, Hill's criminal journey continued. The devastating fire at the Ohio State Penitentiary on April 21, 1930, claimed the lives of three 22 prisoners locked in their cells. In the aftermath, Hill and other inmates orchestrated a mutiny, a rebellion that took several days to put down. Granted parole in July 1937 due to deteriorating health, Hill was admitted to Lucas County Hospital in Toledo. Joseph Muzio, also known as Cowboy Hill, passed away on October 17, 1937, succumbing to cancer. His death certificate bears the name Joseph Muzio. Records show that Hill had married Emma Frances Howell Irons in Toledo on January 19, 1919, under the alias Joseph Muzio. Their formal documents bore the name Joseph Muzio, and their daughter carried the last name Muzio. Hill's death certificate lists Helena, Montana as his birthplace. However, the Montana State Historical Society found no birth, school, or church records for him, leaving a shroud of mystery around the early life of this notorious figure. <laughs>